So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back uh, to this uh, first of the afternoon uh, sessions. I hope you've all been able to enjoy a good lunch and are now ready for some strong uh, book history. Um, during this first of the afternoon sessions, we will focus on what is basically what are basically two opposite sides of the book market. So, both the fierce competition and rivalries and arguments that existed between uh, printers and also the strong business relationships and alliances at local and um, international levels. A key notion in this session will be that of networks and of the methodology um, of studying networks. Unfortunately, I have to announce that uh, Dr. Malcolm Walsby is ill, um, so we won't be able to hear his side of this story uh, in discussing the French uh, book market. Instead, we will start immediately with uh, Dr. Catherine Kikuchi. Catherine is currently a maîtresse de conférence at the University of Versailles Saint-Quentin. And before that, she did a postdoc at the École Française in Rome. Catherine's PhD research focused on the Venice uh, printing world, but she has now opened up uh, that to the whole of the Italian book market. She will speak to us today about economic competition and oligopoly in the Venetian and European printing world. So, Catherine, please, you have it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation, and thank you to the organizers also for this uh, really great conference. Uh, so, as you have been told, I'm focusing mainly on Venice. I will try at the end of my presentation to talk a bit more about uh, Italian book market and European book market. Uh, but this is still a work in progress, so I will be interested also in knowing what you think about it. Um, so, after the first book was printed in Venice in 1469, uh, the city, as you probably know, soon became the first typographic center in Europe. Following the death of Johann de Spira, the first Venetian printer, many individuals became active in the Laguna. And, for example, in the 1480s, uh, the city hosted more than 50 different workshops, which produced almost 100 editions a year. With the birth of a book market in Europe, the competition between printers grew ex increasingly, increasingly strong, um, and in Venice, no strict regulation of the book production was implemented. Even if privileges were granted to some printers and editors, anyone could start printing in the city without having to be part of any guild. Therefore, an increasing number of printers became active, as you can see in this graph. In the first years of printing, the anticipation of book demand was still unstable and very uncertain, as some overproduction crisis showed in Venice. Therefore, many printers and publishers failed and ceased their activity after only one or two editions. Printers and publishers strongly, strongly resented this competition and even qualified it as unfair when they dealt with Venetian authorities. The supplica they wrote to ask for privileges at the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th century often complained against the difficulties of their trade and the, the disloyal practices of their colleagues, as you can see here on one example, but there are many others. Privileges and book commerce have been widely explored, especially in the last few years. The recent work by Dottoressa Erika Squasione, for example, must be noted, for it provides an extensive overview of Venetian privileges. This paper sets out to examine the reality of this competition and how it was dealt, in, dealt with in the practice of book production and commerce. To do so, um, I will try to combine a traditional historical approach on these issues with tools of network sociology and oligopoly economy. First, we must examine if it is really true that the Venetian book market was as competitive as the printers said. There are many ways to evaluate economic competition. In first approximation, we can observe the inequalities inside the Venetian book production evaluated through the number of editions, which raises some methodological issues, but I believe it to be a rather good approximation in this case. During the first years, the disparity between book actors and the concentration of production in the hands of the two companies of Johann of Spira and Nicholas Jensen is striking. Between 1469 and 1480, Johann of Spira, of Spira, his brother Vindelinus, and Johann of Colonia, who ultimately undertook the company, produced 151 editions, which is to say 22% of the Venetian production. 
head of the second most important typographic company, Nicholas Jensen produced 93 editions between 1471 and 1480, which is to say 14% of the Venetian production. If we look into specific years, the disparity is even stronger. In 1471, for example, the two companies produced half of Venetian editions. Other rather successful printers, such as Adam de Ambago or Gabriele di Pietro, occasionally, occasionally produced 12 or 14 percent of the total, but their share in the Venetian pro production is rather stagnant, as you can also see in this uh, chart. This situation ended in 1480, when Johann of Colonia and Nicholas Jensen both died. After that, no printer was able to concentrate in his hands more than 10% of the Venetian production, apart from very rare uh, episodic exceptions. As you can see here, so there are some printers that produce more than 10% for some years, but it doesn't last, and there are no printers that can uh, reach 20%. Um, so there are more competition after 1480. Uh, since 1481, there are more workshops opened, involved in more editions. Uh, for example, six or seven names were involved in five to 10% of the production each. So the 1480s are a moment of dilution of the Venetian production. Uh, the years 1487 and 1488 are paradigmatic of the situation, since only two printers were involved, involved in more than 5% of the production. So the competition in Venetian book production seems to be more open, and many new workshops in these years had a real chance of becoming successful. However, it would be too simple to picture the Venetian printing world as a liberal heaven where free market and free entrepreneurship enabled anyone to work, invest, and be successful. Yes, the disparity between the production of each workshop was less striking, but if we look closely into the repartition of the production, we can observe that the most productive printers are almost always the same individuals between 1480 and 1500. Batista de for example, had rattled until his departure from Venice in 1486, and Rato Ezzani, Bonetto Locatello, uh, and the De Gregory brothers, for example. A few others, such as Bernardino Benali, and Giovanni Taquino have a more irregular production. So we begin to see here uh, the constitution of an oligarchy of printers, which is altered only marginally in the 20 years and mostly in reason of the arrival and departure of some main, main actors. The stability of this elite shows that the opening of the market is really relative. So the sole analysis of the quantitative production of these printers is not enough to examine the competition between them. We analyzed so far the editions in which they were involved, but we overlooked the fact that many editions were printed in collaboration between two printers or publishers, publishers or more. These collaborations had obviously an economic and practical advantage, as we've seen uh, this morning printers or, or, or publishers who manage to establish such collaborations, put in common their knowledge, their commercial networks, economic capital, and decreased the risk of the enterprise. Social network analysis is a useful way to present and to analyze data regarding the collaborations between printers, taking into account names mentioned in the colophons. I will present, present you here networks uh, where each node is a printer or a publisher, a name, in fact, that we find in the colophons, and each link between them uh, is a known collaboration between the two names uh, while they were active. So I, I don't have the time to go uh, deeper into the methodology, but if you have any questions, of course, uh, feel free to ask them. Um, I pass quickly on the first years of printing in Venice. Uh, here is just what the network looks like at the end of the 1470s. Not that much people active in the book, book production yet. The central situation of Johann of Colonia and Nicholas Jetson is yet visible. And I skip ahead to the 1480 uh, period. So during the 1480-1500 uh, period, the number of actors involved increased, as you can plainly see, 
but the number of collaborations increased even more. So the density of the network is higher. Um, there are also less isolated actors than in the previous period. Uh, the book production environment is more coherent. In particular, there is a large central network, uh, here colored in pink and red, where people are more closely linked together. Each node is linked to at least two other nodes. So in social network analysis terms, this is called the Biconnex component. Um, it is a network where capital and expertise flowed and were exchanged. So despite the competition, it is possible to see here um, an economic integration and the constitution of a community of interest. However, even inside this group, discrepancies and hierarchies quickly appeared. Our hypo hypothesis is that these collaborations were also a tool to maintain the domination of a happy few and oligarchy of printers. Um, so at an individual scale, some actors managed to build a large panel of collaborators around them, which allowed them to be involved in numerous editions with limited risk and taking advantage of the diversity of skills. But it is not only an individual evolution. If we observe the networks for the last period I will analyze, so the 1500-1530, uh, we find a group of nodes more densely connected to one another. Um, and the, the darkest part, for example, it is called a four core, uh, which is to say a group where every actor is connected to at least four other of the same group. So it's really dense. Uh, this group, this four core, uh, comprises 27 actors, including very important names of the Venetian printing at the time, Andrea Torizani, Lo Antonio Giunta, or the Scotto family, for example. These actors managed to be integrated in this four core and also had a large number of less integrated collaborators linked to them. This group, uh, you can see here, in which collaborations are frequent and numerous, can be interpreted, as some network sociologists do, as a social, a social niche. So social niche in which economic actors in competition with one another manage to establish a sort of social discipline and trust between actors of equivalent status who recognized uh, each other as valuable partners. Their prestige is due to their inclusion in the group and also to the fact that they include many lesser actors in the economy. It is a logic of inclusion and exclusion. The status of the actors and infinite their economic success is partly due to the capacity of becoming part of a smaller, more selective group of collaboration, and also to the capacity of collaborating with many different actors, including less prominent ones, which are economically dependent on them. The formation of these cores and dense collaborations counterbalances the apparent ferocity of the economic competition in the Venetian printing world, but it also has very important consequences in the global economic organization of the new industry. It can cause some severe disequilibrium um, in that the Venetian situation is quite paradigmatic of industrial markets without regulation. In such situations, some actors use the free competition to their profit. Due to the high capacity of investment, some publishers are able to maintain a large number of collaborations, several at the same time. It creates deep inequalities in the industry and an uneven balance of power between the economic actors. That is to say, an oligopolistic market. It is exactly the situation uh, Jean Tirol, Economic Nobel Prize, studies for contemporary industries. In the absence of state regulations, several powerful companies may form an oligopoly. That is to say, a market dominated by a small number of producers. This is a situation of imperfect competition, which distorts the market. In the Venetian situation, the market is distorted by the fact that many printers become dependent of a few powerful publishers and booksellers who had the important capacity of investment and financed edition in many different workshops. Therefore, the freedom of enterprise in the Venetian printing world is a fact. Everyone is allowed to start a printing activity, but it's also an illusion because not everyone will have the same chances at the start. 
The bookseller Luc Antonio Junta is probably one of the most relevant examples of this situation. In the networks of the end of the 15th and the beginning of the 16th century, he is the most central individual. In particular, he is the one with the most collaborators. However, his international success also shows us uh, that the mere observation of Venetian collaboration networks is not enough to understand this oligopolistic economy. We should also investigate the commercial networks in Italy and Europe these booksellers and publishers had built. Their strength in the Venetian printing world is based on an extensive and intensive use of commercial networks outside Venice since the books printed in the Laguna aimed a European market. So this oligopolistic competition can also be studied at a regional, regional or international level since the relations Venetian printers built with their retailers throughout Europe also contributed to reinforce the advantage of certain printing and librarian companies. This is, as I said, still a work in progress and I will, be, uh, and I will also build the end of my communication on the large bi bibliography that studies the Italian book trade. In northern Italy, since Venetian printers were sometimes the first non-local book merchants present in the city, they soon managed to build very strong business relationships. Nicola Johnson's uh, company, for example, with the lasting work of the German merchant Peter Ugelheimer, managed, for example, to build a very strong network in Germany, northern Italy, and Tuscany. This network was a huge ad advantage in comparison to other Venetian printers, and obviously helped this company to establish its supremacy in the Venetian printing world. After the death of Janson and his new partner, Johan of Colonia, Andrea Torrezani, probably Janson's apprentice, <coughs> benefited from the commercial structure already in place. Some documents from the Archivio di Stato di Milano clearly demonstrate how Ugelheimer continued to work on behalf of Janson's company after Janson's death but in close connection to Andrea Torrezani, who lived in Milan at that time. The recuperation of such a powerful and extended network helped Andrea Torrezani to fortify his position in the Venetian market. It allowed him to have multiple collaborations because he had a large market coverage thanks to the partnership with local booksellers and representatives. At the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th, Venetian printers and booksellers had to face an increasing competition at a Euro European scale. They began to search more stable and direct connections to local markets. There were many ways they could achieve such a goal. Uh, they could bought bookshops, uh, which they rent to local booksellers, whereas before they just had some privileged partnerships. Uh, for, for example, Luc Antonio Junta in Palermo, the Giolitti in Ferrara. Um, also, to take into account the specificities of local markets, some printers began to ask for privileges not only in Venice, where they produced their books, but also to other authorities. For example, Gabriele Giolitti, whose family came from Ferrara, asked for privileges in Ferrara to sell books produced in Venice or to print in Ferrara's territory. Ultimately, some of the major companies built a polycentric structure and established subsidiary companies. The Junta in Lyon, the Joliti in Monferrato, for example. This meant a lasting decentralization and allowed them to be closer from the demand of the market. Thanks to this more complex economic structure, these companies also had the means to reach more distant markets directly and without intermediaries. The Junta are particularly a good, good example for that. Venetian archives documents show that the Junta company dealt in maritime commerce, for example. Documents from the Sardiati archives also show that the commerce Junta had with Lyon was quite a prosperous one in collaboration with the Sardiati company. These powerful Venetian companies built polycentric and complex networks that allowed them to reinforce their domination not only with, on the Venetian competitors, but also on the other European competitors having a closer link to local markets and demands, having relationships also with other local authorities and merchants. Not only did this reinforce the olig oligopolistic structure in Venice, but it, also, it is also the beginning of a more unified European market that began to have itself an olig oligopolistic structure. This is a hypothesis I'm working on. So to confirm this hypothesis, we have to study the relationships of these booksellers with local producers 
Do we have the same patterns as we have in Venice? Um, I would like to take two, example here, two examples here, that of Lyon and that of Brescia. Lyon has already been studied quite a lot, so I will go relatively quickly on this. Uh, with the creation of the first subsidiary companies, Italian and French printers and booksellers in the city concluded an association which is called the Compagnie des Libraires. The first version of it is concluded in 1504 and a variety of important booksellers are part of it. However, a second version of this association is structured around one individual, the Cimborgo Gabbiano, the nephew of Giovanni Bartolomeo Gabbiano, a Venetian-based bookseller. It seems that the company managed to use the competition and the collaborations in Lyon just as they did in Venice. This is also the case without the official presence of a representant or a subsidiary company, and I would like to use the example of Brescia to conclude this communication. Brescia's printing industry was very dynamic during the last decades of the 15th century, and Venetian printers did not manage to penetrate this market as much as they would, as much as they would like. However, Brescia's printing industry began to weaken in the 16th century. At the same time, we observe the presence of one Venetian actor in Brescian sources linked with Brescian printers, Luca Antonio Giunta. Benedetto Britannico, a Brescian printer, stated in his 1534 Estimo some very important depths in favor of Venetian booksellers, in particular Luca Antonio Giunta. In 1537, Lodovico Britannico acted as a proxy for Luca Antonio Giunta, who bought and paid paper to Brescian merchants. It seems that the Britannico family, a great uh, printer family, fell into Giuntia's uh, sphere of influence. This kind of dependence of local printers to Venetian entrepreneurs could be observed also in Padua as soon as the 1480s, where the local book production was in part at the localization of Venetian printers. But Brescia's case shows that Venetian printers intensified their relations to local markets even more, even more as time goes by. I believe that the creation of a unified and integrated production market is particularly strong in northern Italy, and that Venetian printers, with a high level of capitalization and capacity of investment, were the key of it. The oligopolistic market, which we were able to observe in Venice, should also be investigated at a more larger scale, and I believe we should have some very interesting results by doing so. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>